This is Investor Perspectives. I'm the host of Investor Connect, Hall Team Martin, where we connect startups and investors for funding. In our new Investor Perspective series entitled, How to Solve the Biotech Life Sciences Problem, you hear about the growth in the biotech life sciences segment. As the COVID pandemic passes, we emerge into a new world. The biotech space is now undergoing tremendous change as we shift back to a normal way of life. The process for designing and approving vaccines demonstrated a new protocol. Biotechnology now moves into a new era. We have investors and startup founders describe the changes coming up. Hope you enjoy this episode. Need help in finding investors for your startup, fund, or angel group? Tin Capital provides funding as a service helping you find accredited investors. Contact Tin Capital to gain access to investors for angel and venture capital funds, family office rounds, and syndication raises. To learn more, go to tincapital.group. Our first guest is Yaniv Snior, co-founder of Mid-Atlantic BioAngels. Mid-Atlantic BioAngels is a New York-based life science angel investor group that invests exclusively in therapeutics, devices, and diagnostic companies worldwide. Yaniv, thank you for joining us again. Thank you, Hal. Thanks for inviting me. Great. So tell us more about your work and what you do. So we are a life science angel investor group. We invest exclusively in therapeutics, devices, and diagnostics pretty much all over the world, but uh, very narrowly within that focus. So we don't do any healthcare IT or digital health or things of that that nature. We just try to concentrate on the deep end of the pool of the life sciences. Well, great. So let's talk about the growth in the biotech life science segment. Where do you see it today and where do you see it going in the near future? Yeah, I think that uh, if you look at the pre-pandemic situation where... Perhaps there was uh, consumer sentiment was not as favorable to the life sciences, and there were a lot of the issues in terms of drug pricing, et cetera, which I'm sure some continues to this day. The remarkable efforts and achievement of the life science companies in response to the current pandemic, I think, have boosted the, the perception and the morale of the, of the entire life science segment. Uh, you see record IPOs coming out in life sciences. And certainly there's a, there's a lot of activity that's happening in this field right now. So it's a growing field. A lot of companies either starting up or pursuing new opportunities or opportunities that have been presented because of COVID. There are things that the pandemic has allowed for certain things that have become faster, certain barriers that were before that have been overcome. Obviously, it, it, the, the production of vaccines in such a short amount of time broke barriers and still kept to, you know, FDA guidelines, et cetera. So a lot of work has been done. A lot of remarkable work has been done and, and has been accepted now by, by the public. And I think we're going to be doing many things like this in the future as well. So how did the vaccine development change the process? Certainly it sped it up, but what other elements did it change that we're probably not going to go back to the old way we're going to continue going forward? I think the entire collection and review process of applications by the FDA and everything of that uh, sort has has changed and has sped up. I think where there was perhaps reluctance to do things remotely in the past, that has changed completely. Data collection for clinical trials, everybody's more accepting of the fact that things are being done remotely, electronically. And all of those things that have put, been put into place right now are going to survive this pandemic and benefit any kind of development in the future. Even teams working remotely and more, and more cooperatively. You know, our groups, personally, you know, I could never have afforded prior to the pandemic to be in so many conferences around the world, participating in so many places and meeting so many companies, you know, because I didn't have the time or the budget to fly around, etc., and now from the comfort of my own uh, home office, I was able to be in many different places in the world, meeting multiple companies, uh, different countries. So some, some of these things are going to become a lot more regular. So I think there are a lot of benefits that will, will accrue for the future. Our next guest is Carter Williams, CEO and managing partner at iSelect Fund. iSelect Fund is an early stage venture firm that invests in companies that are addressing critical global issues in large markets with financially attractive business models. They're based in St. Louis, but they take a national view with a regional focus outside the coast and on companies making an impact. 
Carter, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Great. So tell us more about your work and what you do. We are a venture fund. We focus on uh, start in our investments in the seed and A stage and invest throughout the entire life cycle of the companies. We focus in and around the area of food and health. We operate sort of around the principle that we spend $1.7 trillion a year on food and we spend $1.9 trillion on the healthcare costs related to poor nutrition. And so we really see that as the same market. And if you really want to fix healthcare, you really got to fix food. Well, that's a good point. So let's talk about the growth in the biotech life sciences segment. You have a front row seat there with your fund and so forth. What do you see as the growth story there? Well, we focus very much in and around ag tech. Half our portfolio is healthcare, half of it's ag tech. The ag tech world and, and elements of uh, biotech are are hitting a transformal point. I mean, we certainly have seen a lot in biotech over a long period of time, but I often make the analogy that if you look at the IT industry circa 1980, 1990, it really made a departure. AT&T got broken up, you know, things changed dramatically, the world changed, and we ran that play for 20 or 30 years. I think in biotech, we've got a similar kind of approach when we think about things like GMO, people were frustrated about GMO. GMO is being replaced by CRISPR. And CRISPR is being used to cure cancer and change our food. And so I think that we, we're we recognizing that biology will keep moving forward and it's moving forward at an accelerating pace. And, and there's a lot of pressure to improve health. And so all the planets are aligned for a good 20, 30 years of really dramatic investment and opportunity in the biotech space. Our next guest is Maximilian Body, founding partner at Nucleus Capital. Nucleus Capital is a new venture capital firm supporting purpose-driven entrepreneurs solving systemic challenges to planetary and human health. They are sector-focused and invest in synthetic biology, climate, and food technology, partnering with founders at the nucleus of their journey, investing at their pre-seed stage. Maximilian, thank you for joining us. Martin, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Great. Well, let's start with, tell us more about your work and what you do. Absolutely. So I started Nucleus Capital about 10 months ago, and uh, we are a new venture capital firm supporting purpose-driven entrepreneurs, trying to solve you know, some of those very pressing planetary health and human health challenges and that we face today, predominantly climate change. And... You know, we are pretty much a startup ourselves. So it's a brand new firm uh, targeting systemic change in biology, food, and climate. And uh, we invest super early, so pre-seed and seed. Great. So let's talk about the the biotech and the life science segments. How do you see it growing and where do you see it going from here? But to give you a better understanding of what I mean um, when it comes to the intersection of synthetic biology and food, for example, and climate as well, right? One of my portfolio companies called Kua um, is developing the very first or the world's first uh, molecular chocolate. And they do this um, using side stream materials from the food industry, as well as precision fermentation. And essentially what they try to do is they map the key flavor components of chocolate, as well as bitterness and the kind of taste that unfolds once you have it once you have it in your mouth and they try to re-engineer those kind of flavor components using the side streams and then in a second step um, they engineer yeast cells to produce milk proteins to come up with the cocoa butter and eventually what happens is you have this entirely new chocolate that is 100% more sustainable because um, I'm not sure if you know this but Cocoa is actually following beef and lamb very closely in terms of the environmental footprint. So for one kilogram of cocoa produced, there's about 17 kilograms of CO2 equivalent. So it has a huge footprint. And the idea here is to use synthetic biology to systemically change the value chain, right? You can produce chocolate in the lab in a, using a fermenter without the need for the typical supply chain that's associated with it. And the side 
the very positive side effect, and this is what I mean with the intersection of food, synthetic biology, and climate, is obviously that you have the climate impact, you have the food, and you have the biology in here. Our next guest is Ron Palawoda, president at Palawoda Group. Palawoda Group's evergreen health tech fund targets early stage innovation that reduces costs to healthcare consumers, including projects that promote cost transparency to help consumers make more informed decisions in selecting service providers. Ron, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So tell us more about your work and what you currently do. Okay. We're a family office based out of New York City, and we focus using investment teams in both private equity and venture capital, primarily focused on opportunities in the United States. And in in the ventures side, we maintain three evergreen funds targeting early stage startups, one in the digital media space, second in the green technology space, looking for eco-friendly ways of doing business. And the third one is in the health technology sector, our sweet spot seems to be on ways to reduce the cost of healthcare to consumers. In the United States, obviously the cost savings to healthcare providers don't necessarily translate into cost savings to patients. So we don't want to cure cancer. We really want to make treatment more affordable. So that's kind of what we do. Great. Well, let's talk about the growth in the biotech life sciences segment. What do you see going on there today? Okay. We really need to break it down into pre-COVID trends and post-COVID trends. Pre-COVID, we've seen the emergence of information technology and advanced analytics in the health tech space. And we've seen the development of uh, tools of insight when they're been applied to drug discovery applications in small molecule therapeutics. That's one trend. We've seen it in non-invasive diagnostics, such as uh, improved image analysis in radiology and pathology. And we've seen it in uh, more personalized medicine, for example, diagnostics that match treatment to the precise molecular profile and clinical history of each patient. And these three trends are still ongoing. However, after COVID, we've seen a disruption in the traditional ways that healthcare is being delivered in the United States, uh, specifically the acceleration and adoption of consumer-facing health technology. So, for example, before COVID, telemedicine applications, those that encourage patients to use online care options, really had minimal health benefits. There has been increase in the number of, of office visits by patients and really a reduced number of new patients, sorry, they increased the numbers of office visits and they reduced the number of new patients that providers can accept. So there wasn't really a strong adoption of telemedicine. After COVID, obviously, we needed new ways for doctors and patients to communicate. So really virtual office visits went from a novel alternative to the primary, if not exclusive option. Now, will that trend last? That's really still to be determined. So far, patients view telemedicine as a great way to save time and money by reducing the need for office visits. But healthcare is really complicated and patients may overreact to minor symptoms or not be clear enough in describing the situation remotely. So that may lead doctors to feel obligated to schedule an office visit in order to ensure quality of care. So we don't know exactly what's gonna happen with telemedicine, but it certainly has fueled further innovation in that space in this post-COVID environment. So that's one major change that we've seen post-COVID. Another change that we've been really excited about is a greater adoption, post-COVID, a greater adoption of consumer health applications as personal diagnostic tools. Before COVID, we went through this phase where wearable gadgets like dedicated fitness trackers, such as Fitbit and so on, were in vogue, but really that, that trend really fizzled out before COVID. After COVID, we've seen healthcare applications on a smartphone being used more frequently. And I should take a pause here, I think, and really delineate two types of 
gadgets and, and, and consumer facing applications. One is what I call health applications. And those are applications that you find on the app store with respect to your diet, your exercise, yoga, mental wellness. And the consumers really were willing to pay out of pocket for these healthcare applications. And these are different from medical grade applications, those that you use to visit your doctor and so forth. Those are We've seen resistance by consumers to pay out of pocket for those. Those are really paid by insurance reimbursement. And after COVID, we've seen that more healthcare applications are beginning to move into the direction of medical care products. So uh, we've seen a lot of data being accumulated by these healthcare applications and those being used to provide some medical grade insights. I think that longer term, we're going to see that trend continue and even accelerate. Our next guest is Oren Aloni Charas, Managing Partner at the Global Health Impact Fund. Global Health Impact Fund is a venture fund focused on investing in early stage healthcare innovation. It is physician led and physician driven and leverages the expertise of large networks of physicians and domain experts with his proprietary data science platform. Warren, thank you for joining us again. Paul, it's great to be back speaking with you. Thanks for having me. Great. So tell us more about your work and what you do. Well, I guess it it would be incomplete to not start by saying, first and foremost, I'm a doctor and an anesthesiologist, and I've been in practice for over 20 years, although now I've retired from that, and I'm full-time in the investment world. I am the managing partner and CEO of an emerging fund called the Global Health Impact Fund. We're a doctor-centric fund. I'd say 80 to 90% of our limited partners actually in the first fund were doctors. And our goal was to take the worlds of medicine and the people who work in it, the physicians and the other clinicians who are accredited, and the world of innovation and mix them, get the doctors to have a seat at the table early on. And it created a great strategic benefit for us with respect to investing. We had great deal flow. We had essentially insiders views into all of these companies because they're early and they don't have market validation, things like that. So having the boots on the ground people, the doctors helping us look at these companies really made a difference. And then once we've invested in these companies, the ones in our portfolio, we've been able to provide them some fairly unique support to help them grow and be successful. Great. Well, let's talk about the growth in the biotech life sciences segment. What do you see going on there? Wow, there's so much. I mean, you know, it it would be wrong not to start with talking about things like telemedicine and, you know, remote patient monitoring and chronic monitoring platforms, because that's just a whole new space. It was in its infancy pre-COVID. And then, you know, the demand that COVID put on people, doctors and patients, really blew that up. And so there's been a tremendous amount of activity in that space that we didn't see coming two or three years ago. Usually you see this path, you know, as things start to happen. Although we as a fund have been involved in that space, but but the growth has just been remarkable. And I think that you're going to see an evolution. I think we've gotten our first, our 1.0 products and maybe even some 2.0 products into the field. But I think you're going to start to see a greater level of sophistication in terms of the interfaces and and the goals of telemedicine where it transforms from being a Zoom call essentially to something very sophisticated and not quite as good as having somebody do a physical exam on you and be in their office, but but something pretty close to that. But there are other areas that were already booming and bursting at the seams and growing that we can continue to see growth in. You can't ignore the impact of CRISPR technologies and genomics and the interesting science around that. There's a lot of material sciences. And of course, we're very interested in the fund into the artificial intelligence and machine learning area. And there's just great, great, you know, innovation being made in those spaces. So really across the board, healthcare is just a fantastic space to be. Hall, the interesting thing I find about healthcare, if you're going to go into the real science of it, the real, you know, medical solutions rather than consumer products, It's just really important to do that with people who understand what they're looking at because everything seems so exciting. And if you can't have a 
critical eye towards the innovations, it's easy to get fooled into thinking something's going to be successful when it really didn't have the the bones to be that. Our next guest is A.L. Lischitz, co-founder and managing partner at Peregrine Ventures. Founded in 2001, Peregrine Ventures is a leading Israeli capital fund that focuses on high-tech companies in various stages in their fields of life sciences, pharma, digital health, and more. Hey, Al, thank you for joining us again. Thank you all for having me here. It's a pleasure to be again. Can you tell us more about your work and what you currently do? Yeah, so we are venture capitals here in Israel. Um, We invest uh, for more than 20 years. We invest in life science companies in Israel and around the world. Um, we invest in pharma companies, we invest in medical devices, we invest in what we call today digital health. Um, in all stages, uh, we have our early stage arms in which we invest in very early stage companies, including Technology Incubator, where we invest in ideas which really just started or even before that we are about to start. And we invest also very late um, through, in our, through our crossover uh, funds. We invest in the, at the very late stages. And this is uh, just before IPO, before m a now before SPAX, which became uh, became trendy. Maybe, maybe it was trendy. So that's what we do. A lot of our investments are in Israel, but also we invest outside the States and a bit in other places also. Great. Well, let's talk about the growth in the biotech life sciences segment. What do you see happening here? So there are, I would divide it into three. I would, uh, first of all, look on, on the pharma side, and this is on mainly in oncology, also other spaces, but mainly on oncology, which became uh, very aggressive in the last years uh, because of many reasons, also because of development tools that developed in the last decade. We see um, that taking a completely new oncology target, for example, which 20 years ago was a 20 year long story. Today, you can be after five, seven years, you can be already deep within phase one, which is a huge change, which, uh, which brings a lot of hope to develop and to bring new, interesting biological drugs, meeting oncology to the market. It also makes the buyers more aggressive since the pharma companies, they know that they have really to come in and buy companies early, which makes the market very interesting because on one side, you have an IPO market, which is hungry for those interesting new technologies. And it has to be a new technology. It can't be another Me Too, another um, technology which was used before. It has to be a completely different angle to how to attack the cancer. But if it is a new target which attacks the cancer, the pharma companies become very aggressive. And they tend to buy companies at the end of phase one, beginning of phase two, which is also where the stock markets really have to compete and also be able to take those companies public rather early. So we see extremely strong IPOs for very interesting companies, end of phase one, beginning of phase two, which we did not see five or seven years ago, which is, again, it's different of what there was before, and it's very interesting. I would say this is on the pharma side. On the device side, we see two interesting things happening. First of all, we see IPOs are looking for companies who have substantial sales. Substantial sales is tens of millions of dollars of sales. Now, it depends what area it is. Um, If it's an area which you expect a hockey stock of sales, then you can, sometimes you can take a company public of 10, 20 million dollars. If it's something which is less steep, it would be more 50 million dollars or more. Having said that, an interesting alternative for the IPO market, there is the SPAC space, which became very hot mainly in the first and second quarter of this year. There were literally the numbers of SPACs which went public just in the first quarter were more than the whole of last year. And also last year was quite an active one in SPACs. So there were a lot of SPACs that came out to the market. So a SPAC is, is the company which, is, which goes public, which has nothing in it but cash and has 18 months to merge with an interesting 
technology company, and it can be in every space. It doesn't have uh, it doesn't have to be in particular technology uh, company. Although most SPACs merge with uh, technology companies, but it can also be in other spaces. But in, on the technology SPACs, what we see is uh, companies that go public. They raise only cash, and it's somewhere between a hundred and three four hundred million dollars. That's the average SPAC. Those are much bigger ones. And then they have 18 months to go and look for a candidate, a target, an interesting company. It has to be a company which is close to have all the parameters needed to be a good public traded company and then merge with it. Uh, merge with it at, the, at an agreed value between the technology company and the SPAC. Now, what happened was that the street, there were so, so many of these were happening that the street started not really to like those SPACs. And this is something like a quarter ago. Uh, so some, some were May, June of 21. We saw that um, the SPACs became less attractive because some of these mergers between those empty companies, the SPACs and the target companies were done on very high valuations for the target companies a bit too high or sometimes much too high for Wall Street to really to agree to those valuations. And therefore, the prices of those shares went down after, after the mergers. Now, as it happened quite a few times, it became more difficult to make those facts and to, bring, uh, to make them public. What we see today is very interesting. We see two different sort of SPACs. We see what we call the purely financial SPACs. These are people from, these are bankers, mainly bankers that were able to raise a SPAC and now are looking for targets. And there it, sometimes it's, it, it can be challenging to, to have, uh, to bring a good deal to the street. Or we have what we call the professional targets. And those are companies and it can be in, in whatever area, which you have people that are seasoned managers in that space that went and raised money and now merge with merge that money, merge their SPAC with a company in the same space and bring added value to the company which they now bring public in management, in experience, etc. Now, in order for this SPAC really to happen and for Wall Street to agree to the price, there has to be a pipe which comes together with the merger of the SPAC and the target company. So let's say the target uh, company is valued at $800 million and the SPAC has $200 million in it. Then the SPAC, uh, the pipe which puts this, all of that together has to be at least a hundred to $200 million pipe. So that which will agree, this has to be smart money that understands that space, which joins now this merger, this $800 million target company and the $200 million SPAC. Now, another $100 or $200 million pipe comes and agrees to the price. When this happens from good investors, then those SPACs mergers actually go very well. So we here we see now an interesting difference between what we call the financial SPACs, which have more difficulties versus the professional SPACs. These are SPACs in which there are professional people in the certain space, which now merge with a company in the same field and bring added value. And those SPACs tend now to be more interesting. Our final guest is Mark Groper, CEO at Orion Biotechnology. Orion Biotechnology is a clinical stage biopharmaceutical company focused on discovering and developing best in class immunotherapeutics based on novel recombinant chemokin analogs. Their goal is to significantly improve the health outcomes of populations affected by serious diseases in the area of oncology, neuroinflammatory disorders, inflammatory bowel disease, HIV, and others. Mark, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Great. Well, tell us more about your work and what you do. So Orion Biotechnology is a clinical stage company, which is unlocking really the therapeutic potential and a multi-billion dollar market opportunity for one of the largest group of drug targets in the pharmaceutical industry called G-protein coupled receptors or, or GPCRs for short. This group of cell receptors has been highly sought after by the pharmaceutical industry because they've proven to deliver effective treatment for many serious disease categories, 
including cancer and neurological disorders and viral infections, to name a few. And in fact, about 40% of successfully marketed drugs today achieve their effect through interaction with GPCRs. Unfortunately, industry has really just scratched the surface of the GPCR potential with only about 15% of the 800 receptors in the GPCR superfamily having been effectively drugged to date. And the problem really is that many attractive GPCR targets have very complex ligand structures, which have proven to be undruggable using traditional drug modalities based on either small molecules or antibodies. And as a result of that, more than 80% of this very large market opportunity remains untapped. So Orion essentially has overcome this problem by developing a proprietary technology platform that enables precision engineering of uh, small peptides and proteins, really facilitating the creation of a new class of precision engineered drugs, which can effectively target these complex receptors. Orion has leveraged this technology to create already a multi-asset portfolio of drug candidates. We currently have three in development, including our lead, which is a GPCR targeted cancer immunotherapy with proven best-in-class potency. So we're very excited about it. Great. Well, let's talk about the growth in the biotech life sciences segments. What do you see going on there today? Well, the trends uh, moving forward in our industry segment are on precision medicine and also on the development of immunotherapy, which can successfully treat many serious disease types, including cancer, for example, and, and trying to make things like chemo and radiation therapy, a thing of the past. So precision medicine is a key area where the industry is moving towards trying to address these diseases. And with our precision engineering platform, we're sort of at the forefront of that, of that movement. Thank you for joining us today. As always, be sure to leave a review, subscribe to this podcast, and share it with others. Let's go start up something today.